Good evening, everyone. Um, we're night or afternoon or wherever you're joining us from. I'm sure we have uh, lots of folks across the world. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad everyone can join us. Um, welcome to today's uh, Herbal Balan Lecture Series presentation by Frank Romano, uh, Phototype Setting in the Second Revolution. Uh, my name is Alexander, and I'm one of the instructors in the Type of Cooper program, which is presenting today's talk. Uh, for those who may not know, Type of Cooper is a postgraduate certificate program in typeface design with a dedicated uh, annual lecture series. So this is the lecture series that we've uh, been running since the start of the program in 2010. Um, it, um, the lecture series is part of the extended program in typeface design, and the lectures sort of uh, follow the uh, the topics covered in that class in, in the history course um, and allows us to, to delve a little bit deeper into some of the topics, including things like uh, photo typesetting that we're going to hear from Frank today. Tapey Cooper offers uh, lots of type design, lettering, typography, calligraphy related workshops. We also organize the typographics conference and festival every year. Uh, we, we will have one upcoming this June uh, in person in New York. So look out for that announcement soon. You can find more information about the program and the workshops on the website. And I'll paste uh, that into the chat here. So if you're not familiar, you can check it out, but I'm sure you are. And that's why you're here. Um, we have one more lecture coming up uh, to close out the fall uh, cycle of the Herbal Balan lecture series. Uh, we have one talk uh, next Monday. Uh, it'll be at 12.30. So we have a, 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 a two kind of time slots that we tend to have lectures now that they're um, through uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, so on December 6th, next Monday at 12.30, uh, Eastern Time, we will have a talk titled Intercultural and Decolonial, Exploring Frameworks for Typographic Practice with Dr. Rathna Ramunathan. Um, the talk evaluates Western canons and frameworks of typography and asks us to consider why taking an intercultural and decolonial approach to typographic practice is critically needed today. So don't miss that talk. You can sign up for that on our website, and I'll post that into chat as well. So if you go to that, you'll see the, the lecture and you can register for that event. So that will close out the fall um, and we will have four more lectures in the spring term as well. So look out for announcements for that, sign up for the mailing list. Uh, don't don't uh, miss those announcements. Uh, we'll, we'll have the, the lineup, uh, full lineup posted uh, sometime around January. The lectures will begin in uh, February. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes. The talk is being recorded uh, and you could uh, catch it on YouTube. Um, if you wanted to just save the link, you can click in the top left of the Zoom window, um, the toggle live on YouTube. You can select the, you can copy the link. Uh, once the lecture is over, the recording stays on YouTube, but um, once we um, have a chance to edit the talk, it will also go on Vimeo. And uh, for that, I really wanted to thank Type Culture for allowing us to uh, record um, this lecture and the previous lectures we've had to keep adding to our extensive archive collection. So thanks again to Type Culture. And if you wanted to see any of the talks, including this one in, in, in a week or two, you can go to uh, the coopertype.org slash lectures. Um, click on the individual lecture and you should see the, the video embedded in there or go to our collection on vimeo.com. And I'll post both of those links into chat. I'm doing the multitasking. Um, so again, thank you to Type Culture for allowing us to record and post this talk. Um, a few uh, more you know, tiny, tiny um, uh, Zoom uh, um, technical questions or uh, technical issues. Um, the chat is is sometimes a little finicky but um you could see in the chat window 
the little kind of icon that says right above the text, who can see your messages. Um, and make sure to toggle that to everyone if you wanted to send a message to the entire audience watching this. If you uh, select panelists and attendees, only the uh, Frank and the, and, and the team here will see those messages. So if you wanted to send a message to the team, to panelists and attendees, but if you select everyone, everyone will see the, the chat. Um, don't forget there's a Q&A function. We will be taking questions from the Q&A window at the end of the presentation. So stay, stay for that. Um, and now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Frank today, uh, our, our esteemed uh, speaker. I'm very, very excited to have Frank with us. Uh, Frank Romano's career has spanned over 50 years in the printing and publishing industries. He's the author of over 40 books, major histories of hot metal, photo setting, and desktop publishing. He's the editor of the international papers Pocket Pal, a fantastic, invaluable publication uh, seek it out if you don't know. It, it's, it's a really, really fantastic tool. He's a contributor to major encyclopedias and dictionaries and the author of numerous articles. He holds a master's degree in printing technology from the Rochester Institute of Technology, of which he is uh, the uh, Professor Emeritus. Frank is president of the Museum of Printing in Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is just north of Boston. It's uh, home to the only collection of cold type system in the world. Uh, it's a fantastic museum. Uh, the museum curates over 1 million typographic artifacts. If you have a chance, uh, do make a trip out to, to, to see the collection uh, and meet Frank and, and see the amazing, amazing things that they have in there. And I'll post the link to the museum in the chat window so you can all check it out. Um, with, with that, it is my absolute pleasure to, to turn it over to Frank to present Phototype Setting in the Second Revolution in Type. Thanks so much for being here, Frank. Thank you very much. I think I'm all set here. Yep. There we go. Hey, I did it. Fantastic. Well, by the way, the, the, where it says, don't call it cold type, that's the cover of one of my first books. And uh, that was sort of a joke in the industry that, you know, don't call it cold type, it's photo type setting. But uh, because there was hot metal, then everything else was called cold type. And of course, my joke was cold type is what Gutenberg used on a winter's morning. So we're going to talk about technology and typography. And uh, the hot metal foundries, I, I use 1511 as the date because that's when Claude Garamond uh, made type and sold it to other printers. Uh, before that, and even after that, printers made their own type. It was unique to them. Um, but as time went on, we started to see foundries. The Caslon foundry was one of the most famous in England. In fact, the first time anyone ever saw the Declaration of Independence, it was in the typeface Caslon. Um, uh, Bodoni uh, sold type as well. Um, in fact, many of the very famous foundries, some of their fonts were named after the people who founded the foundry. I use 1993 as the end of the foundry ever, and that was the, the date when ATF, American Type Founders, had its auction um, and sold off uh, almost everything that was in the plant in New Jersey. Um, American Type Founders was formed uh, in the 1890s. Um, when 23 of the largest foundries in America merged because the linotype was putting them all out of business. The linotype machine was its own type foundry. And so 1886 was the beginning of the type casting era. Uh, we see the linotype machine. Within a few years, we see the monotype machine. Within a few years, we see the Ludlow machine. The last linotype was manufactured in 1972. In fact, we have that machine here at the Museum of Printing. Uh, photo typesetting began for all intents and purposes in 1949 when Intertype showed the photo setter. Um, eh, probably 1995 is a good date in terms of when the last photo typesetting font was manufactured. And then, of course, in 1985, we have PostScript and the beginning of the digital font era. And uh, so we're going to go through a lot of machines that will be boring, um, and we'll talk about type along the way. Um, so photo typesetting is divided into generations. The first generations were photo mechanical. They were essentially based upon old hot metal machines. The photo setter was an intertype line caster. The monophoto was a monotype machine. Um, and I'll show you them. Uh, th then with photon, we get the second generation. These were electromechanical devices. Um, 
using light um, um, and, and fonts that moved at high speed. Uh, you had the Photon 200B, that was the first one, the ATF B8, and then the CompuGraphic. Then we entered the uh, third generation, which used cathode ray tubes. Uh, this is where you put strokes on the screen and photographed them and made up fonts in various ways. Um, and then the fourth generation entered with the laser. Uh, the Linotronics were the most famous of the machines, but almost everybody in the industry was manufacturing laser-based uh, photo typesetters. I guess you could have to go back to 1925 to find the first mention of using photography to set type. The Bawtree machine, uh, this was from the Penrose Annual that had an article about the device because offset lithography was, was coming in slowly, but it was coming into the industry. Um, and so th there was a lot of movement in terms of how to link the pre-press process, the typesetting process, with the printing process. And so lots of people had ideas, none of them really came to fruition at, at all. And even offset lithography took a while. I mean, it was theoretically invented or discovered in 1900 by a printer in New Jersey who had an accident in terms of how he was printing. Uh, the first machines were made in the early 1900s. The Harris brothers made uh, the early machines. Um, then you had the evolution of offset lithography. Um, in the 1930s, uh, you, if you were an offset lithographer, you could not join the main printing association. They were only for letterpress people. Um, and so that's why the NAPL, the National Association of Photolithographers, Lithographers was formed in order to have a place for lithographers to come together. Uh, lithography started to come into its own, photolithography came into its own during World War II and it was used a lot for map making. And then after the war, then we start to see offset lithography take off. Duplicator presses come out and, and film becomes the basis for the way we make plates and print. And so that's why we now start to see a lot of activity in photo typeset. So Intertype was the first company to try to make a machine. Well, they did make a machine, but it was terrible. It was the worst machine ever. You know who bought it? The federal government. It was a linotype machine because the Intertype and the linotype were very similar. Um, but in, instead of uh, having a, a little mold in the matrix, there was a little piece of film in its belly. And as you keyboarded, it photographed one character at a time. It was the dumbest idea ever. Now they sold a few of them. In fact, I remember they, they hired me to do a story because a typographer in Dallas, Texas, Jagger's Child Stovall, and this is in the early 1970s, um, uh, mid 1970s, um, had bought one of these machines as a typesetting service. And they were thrilled that this company did it. And I flew there and I wrote the article, but I kept wondering why would you buy this machine? The font library, library was so limited in terms of what, what they did was they essentially tried to digitize what they had as a hot metal library. The monophoto was no better, by the way. Um, uh, Bill Garth, who founded CompuGraphic, described it as the only machine ever invented with no stationary parts. Um, by the way, we have one at the museum and it, you can see how kludgy it looks. So the, the font unit, which would have little molds in it, had little pieces of film. And uh, in some models, you could actually change the character set, which by the way, was a phenomenal advantage, but the machine never really took off at all. Um, I remember that the, the, the machine we have at the museum uh, came from because they were looking for the highest quality they could find. They were a very high quality printing company. Um, and they had been using Monotype for their typesetting. And they thought, well, the photo typesetting version has to be as good. Well, it was not. During this early period where you saw most photo typesetting were in the headlining machines, uh, the photo typepositor. Actually, the photo typepositor um, had a two inch film strip. And it was the reason it was that was because the filmotype had come out before it and it used a two inch film strip. And so therefore they felt that they could then take the fonts from the filmotype and not you know, have to move very fast on their own library. Uh, you had the dia type all the way on the right at the top that had a little gun. You, you moved it along, pointed it at the character that you wanted and, and, and pulled the trigger. Um, the down in the lower left is the Marasawa, which is a Japanese machine they sold very few of uh, in the US. Uh, next to it is the strip printer. Um, 
Next to that in the middle is the CompuGraphic 7200, which was the first keyboard operated headlining machine. And I have to say, we can, when I worked there, we couldn't make them fast enough because the, it, it was a bestseller for newspapers for just about anybody. However, the font library was quite limited. And then on the right is the, is the iconic um, machine from Veritiper, the headliner. Um, actually, it was called the Cox headliner because the guy who ran the company was Coxhead. Um, but it had these gramophone records made out of plastic that you used in order to set type. Um, the phototype positor is dear to my heart because when I left Linotype um, in 68, I became their first advertising manager. And having a machine that allowed me to kern was a revelation because in hot metal, of course, I was limited by the matrix, the side walls of the matrix. So you always had this space between certain letters that really needed to be kerned. So the ability to actually have tight spacing and that's what created, I think, a whole new level of typography because of the typositor. And of course, photo lettering was doing it with Rutherford lettering machines um, as a service. But now you could buy your own typositor and set up your own service if you so desired. Um, in 1945 or so, um, one of two Frenchmen um, who worked for ITT in France um, had developed an idea for a phototype sitting machine. Uh, so one of them was René Higonet. So he comes to the United States, he visits MIT, and they suggest that he talks to a man named Bill Garth, who was a graduate who had just formed a company called Lithomat, which was selling uh, paper plate materials that were used for offset printing. So there was a sort of a connection there. Uh, they, they meet and Garth agrees to uh, pay uh, for his partner, Louis Moiru, to come to the United States. He comes over in steerage, by the way. <laughs> they had that in those days. Um, and they, they talk about this machine and Garth realizes that it's gonna take a lot of money to make it a real device. And uh, they form a foundation, the Graphic Arts Research Foundation, and they get funding from a number of newspapers, typesetting services and others to start developing a photo, a real photo typesetting machine. Um, that's Bill Garth on the right, um, always wore a, board, a bow tie and normally he always had a cigar in, in, his, uh, in his hands. Um, that issue of Popular Mechanics shows Vannevar Bush, who had been the president of MIT and Roosevelt's advisor on technology during World War II. And he was a great supporter of, uh, of the device. And uh, so it got covered in Popular Mechanics, which by the way, was a very famous magazine in those days and got a lot of attention. And there he is at the, uh, one of the prototype machines there. And that's what the prototype looked like, by the way. They called it Petunia. And it typeset the first book that was ever done with photo typesetting called The Wonderful World of Insects. I always thought about that, that the first book done with, with hand type was a Bible and the first book done with photo typesetting was a book on insects. That's the first brochure for Photon and that was the first annual report. So the finished machine, the 200B as it was called, you literally sat inside of. And uh, so on, on the right was the keyboarding mechanism a connecting device, and then the, the output unit was at the back. And the way it worked was typical of now almost every photo typesetting machine that would come along of this generation. And that is <coughs> opposite each character or row of characters was something called a timing mark. And as it rotated, whether it was a strip or a disc or whatever, as it rotated, a mechanism was counting the timing marks. And when it found the one that it wanted, it, a, a burst of light from a xenon flash lamp would go through the character and photograph it as though it was standing still. The stroboscopic effect uh, developed by Dr. Edgerton at MIT. Um, after the character was selected, it went through a lens in a lens turret to make it bigger or smaller, um, then through a prism that moved on a track that then moved the width of the character and then exposed it onto photo material. And this was repeated over and over again for each line and for your entire page. Uh, by the way, you could have lenses in a turret or you could have a zoom lens, either one. Uh, this was the drawing from a, the first book, one of the first books I did. Um, and uh, uh, I told the artist that the turret had lenses of, you know, for different point sizes. So he made each lens a different diameter. Technically they should be longer, not wider. Now, what's interesting is 
that a lot of people who needed a drawing like this just stole it from my book. And so that's how I knew because I made a mistake and left it in the book uh, and others just swiped it. The other thing you had to have was one way of storing the width values for every character. So you could put the width values on a card, a plug, you could put it on paper tape. You could even have it as a code on the font itself. But you always had to have an, a mechanism for storing the width values so that the moving prism knew how many clicks to move. Now, the, most of these systems use the 18 unit system that was developed from monotype. So every character had a width based on 18s. Um, and that did the job for a long time. And of course, there were ways of controlling the spacing where you could literally backspace and current if you wanted to do that. Now, photos typesetting with Photon, th these machines were expensive. They were between $40,000 and $100,000. In 1968, at the big Print 68 trade show, the, the first major show of the modern era, um, uh, CompuGraphic took a booth. Now, CompuGraphic was a spin-off from Photon. What happened was uh, Garf spun off the photo typesetting machine is a separate business and they called it Photon. And they forced Bill Garth out. So he and his chief engineer, Ellis Hansen, literally went across the street and started CompuGraphic. They made some interesting machines that weren't really photo typesetters at the beginning. But then in 68, they showed the 2961 and the 20, um, the, uh, I'm gonna get it right, the 2960 and the 4961. Now, I remember, because I was at that show for visual graphics, and um, in fact, I had made some signs for them on the photo type positive. Um, and so I, I went by the booth one day, and I hear this guy, and he's saying to somebody, one of the salesmen, uh, how much is the machine? Oh, he's looking at the sample, and he says, that's crap. How much is the machine? $8,000. That's not bad crap. And so um, this little machine that sold for peanuts um, ushered in a revolution. Because again, no one had seen one that inexpensive before. Now that was the result of Ellis Hansen, who was the chief engineer, but also the most brilliant marketing person I had ever worked for. So as we enter this world, you're gonna find that every company had their fonts in a different format. This was to get around any patents that were out there. So you had glass discs, film discs, plastic discs, film strips, film segments, glass segments, plastic segments, and cartridges. Everybody had something different. Um, we have one of every one of them at the Museum of Printing, and um, it's an amazing collection. Now, photo typesetting is based on photo material, film or paper. Most typesetting was done on paper. And because many of the early users were newspapers, stabilization paper was developed by Kodak. Now, that's the processor at the bottom there. It's called the Ecnomatic. And it had two chemicals, two little bottles stood up on the left-hand side. One had a developer and one had a fix in it. And so usually this was in the dark room, but somebody invented this little box that went on it. It was called a dark box. And you lifted up the cover, you took your photo typesetting cassette where there was about two inches of photo material coming out of it. And then you would get it started and you would feel it moving and then slam the cover down real fast without cutting your finger off. Um, and it would then go through the roll, the chemicals, through the rollers, come out the other side. It was still wet. You would hang it up to dry. Um, and then when it dried, you pasted it up into your, your, your mechanical. Uh, now, this material would fade after a month or so. Um, I have some that goes back to that era, and it's all brown. Uh, but newspapers didn't care. They photographed it, shot film, and then they were done. Um, they just threw it away at that point in time. For people who needed to archive it, they would have the processor above. And that was what they called resin coated paper, RC paper. And that required three chemicals, a developer, a wash, and a, a developer, a fix, and a wash. I'll get it right. Um, and so you had those two materials and then some firms used film, but it came out as positive film. And that was a little harder to handle by many people. The third major photo, fourth major photo typesetter was the ATF B8. It was the, actually the just a writer. The, the front end was a unit that punched paper tape and the back end essentially printed out with a photo typesetting uh, font. It was a, a little plastic disc. It never really went anywhere. 
Um, af after it's about two years, they discontinued it and it was gone. Now, when I joined, joined Mergenthaler, uh, right out of high school, 1959, I needed a job. And my guidance counselor said, well, I know of this company, Mergenthaler. I said, what do they do? He said, something to do with books. I said, that sounds interesting. And so I got there in 59 um, as the mailboy, <laughs> delivering mail to every department. Um, I learned a lot about the company by just reading the memos in the, uh, in the mail room as I was sorting the mail. Um, and at that time, they were just coming out with the linofilm. Linotype had put off the whole area of phototypesetting. From what I could read and hear, uh, they thought that that hot metal was going to last another 20 years. Um, that, that wasn't the case. Phototypesetting was coming in very quickly um, because of CompuGraphic more than any other reason. And again, they overdid it with this machine. The linofilm was uh, three feet wide, uh, seven feet high, and, and I think 10 feet long. It, the top part of the machine was all tubes. Um, I once won a bet by cooking an egg on the top of the machine. It required a very specialized keyboard. Um, and all the fonts were on these glass discs and they were very expensive. Again, Photon realized the 200B was not the machine. So they came out with a faster machine called the 713. Um, and then there were all kinds of versions of the 713 as time went on. So the problem was fonts. And so every one of these companies, CompuGraphic and Photon being the two most interesting, um, essentially took hot metal fonts, linotype fonts, uh, did printouts, then blew them up, then they became fuzzy, but then they would cut ruby lists. There's a word you haven't heard recently. Uh, cut ruby lists to get a clean, sharp edge, and then they photographed them in cameras. Uh, at Photon, they actually had this wall with uh, several openings in a curve, and they had these, I'm sorry, little old ladies sitting there, and they would take the artwork and put them into the little slots, and then at the other end of the room, the camera would photograph several of them, advance the photo disc, which was coated with silver halide. And then the ladies would take them out and then put another four or five in and then photograph them and shift. And so making a disc, uh, and, and by the way, literally every disc was made from scratch. They, they didn't know how to make one and they made copies of it later, which only came when they got into film. Now, the Linofilm from Linotype didn't do very well, so they tried to create a cheaper version called the Linofilm Quick. And it wasn't that quick, by the way. Um, and it was a very strange machine. It illuminated every character in the font. And then a series of wedges moved up and down and closed out all the light for all the characters you didn't want and only got the light for the one you did want go through. And because of this movement of the wedges, the machine literally would cha-cha across the floor. It moved. And so you literally had to put it on the, a foundation and bolt it to the ground. It didn't do well either. Now, all of these machines required specialized keyboards. And what's interesting is this, this to me is a very important area in terms of how women got into the printing industry. Before that, it was really male dominated in every way. By the way, if you get a chance, read Briar Leibitz's recent book, um, uh, of, about this subject. Um, but these keyboards used typewriter keyboards. They did not use the linotype ETAOIN approach because the ETAO was done literally controlled by the unions and the unions were very male dominated. When we now started to have typewriter keyboards, now other people could use it, not trained ITU people, but literally anyone. And so that's how women began to, to enter the, the, the workplace in, in the printing industry. Um, now, the problem with these keyboards was also there were a, a lot of other keys because you then had to control not only the characters that you saw, but the commands that told you how to see them. What point size, what line length, um, whether there was indents or not, all of this had to be given as codes to control the output device. Harris, uh, had acquired Intertype, and they then moved aggressively in photo typesetting with very big machines, very expensive machines. Again, they did not sell that well. Again, CompuGraphic was literally taking over the industry because they were the inexpensive machine. Now, they were not high quality. So the reason you would buy one of these machines was theoretically because the quality was better. 
So I just spoke about CompuGraphic, but you can see they use the film strip. Um, when I joined, the, by the way, you now heard I've been I was at Mergenthaler, then Visual Graphics, and CompuGraphic, and um, at CompuGraphic we were having the annual meeting one year, and we used our cafeteria, and so I had pictures taken of how we made fonts, and I I mounted them on the walls to dress the place up, and the guy who ran the type division went to Ellis Hansen, one of the founders, and said, Romano's showing people how we make fonts. And Ellis said, we could use the help. <laughs> and he was right, because the problem they had was they couldn't get fonts out fast enough, and the quality was not very good. The machine that changed everything again was the CompuWriter. I was, I was the one who named this machine. I did all the marketing on this machine. Um, when we introduced it in 71, it was unbelievable. It was $6,950, but it included the photo typesetting unit and the keyboard. It was all self-contained. Um, you could move it around easily on a dolly. Um, and, and again, it just, sales were unbelievable. Veritiper then in 74 uh, created a version of it, but they used a cathode ray tube and that, gave you more text that you could deal with, you could see your codes better. Um, that made a difference. And that was an inspiration for CompuGraphic for them to do the edit, the edit writer, which would come out later. There was also AlphaType because the AlphaType system photographed every character while it was standing still, its quality was higher. So it was very popular with advertising typographers. Um, however, it was very complicated to operate I remember this one operator went from plant to plant as a job and kept getting a higher and higher salary. The machine that made Linotype in photo typesetting was the VIP, Variable Input Photo Typesetter. The lower font was the main font that they used. It was a little film segment. If you wanted to do display sizes, you used the bigger version, which was above. It was introduced in 1971 and it did relatively well in every kind of firm primarily in typesetting services. Now, you have to remember, in terms of font libraries, the main font library in America was the Linotype library. That was it. Um, you had some monotype fonts that were out there that people wanted for book work, uh, and they would either use a monophoto or a monotype itself. Um, there were fonts in hot metal that had been imported from Europe but for most people, it became the Linotype library. So if you were getting into photo typesetting, one of your jobs was to steal the fonts from Linotype. Now, I use the word steal because there is no law against it. Typefaces, the design of typefaces has never been part of the Copyright or Patent Act. They, in fact, they're specifically excluded in most cases. Linotype tried to sue the patent office to register a typeface made, uh, designed by Zoff, and it failed. Because again, since the beginning of the Copyright Act, typefaces were not included. Now, supposedly there was one font that got a copyright. Um, it was called Dracula's Blood. And I've never seen a sample, but I can kind of visualize it. And maybe that was unique enough to do that. But over the years, we've tried many ways to get fonts registered. Now, Adobe later came up with registering the underlying code that output a digital font. <coughs> But there are ways to get around that as well. In fact, the, there was a company called Storch that I think made more money on Linotype fonts than Linotype made because they made fonts. Uh, and by the way, they, they were sued by Linotype and lost. Linotype lost because Storch moved several characters around and changed the clipping mechanism. And so it was unique in most respects. So Storch made a fortune selling ripoffs of Linotype fonts. L later, uh, Photon was bought by Dymo, um, and they came out with a machine called the Pace Setter. And the original concept was that each font was a little film, uh, I'm sorry, glass segment, uh, but it was not very successful until they decided to just make it a glass disc. GSI, Graphic Systems Incorporated, was a spinoff from CompuGraphic. Um, they painted their machines purple so they would stand out. Uh, Sam Blum was the, the marketing guy, so they called them Blum's Plums. Um, GSI was later sold to Wang. Then in 78, CompuGraphic came out with the Edit Writer, their answer to the uh, Veritiper of uh, CompSet and CompEdit, um, and it, it sold relatively well. Um, 
And again, they use the film strip. At this time, word processing is doing very well. People in offices are using machines that store information, let you edit information. And the concept was, why take that information, print it out, and have somebody re-keyboard it in order to set it in type? And so as a result, we now start to see interfaces that take disks and, and, and other data from word processors and convert it into typesetting input. Now, the whole idea of using TV sets came about because of Dr. Hell. He was a master in sort of reducing everything to dots or strokes, if you will. Um, he invented a scanner, a color scanner, which was very popular for a long time. Um, and using, and by the way, he also developed a lot of ideas for facts. Uh, um, and so as a result, he took this technology and created a machine called the DigiSet, which used a cathode gray tube and on the screen created characters. By the way, the first company to do that in the United States, believe it or not, was A.B. Dick. Albert Blake Dick IV, um, uh, you know, they sold mimeographs and offset duplicators. Um, he went to Stanford University and he said, I got a whole group of scientists and engineers together and he said, I want you to invent what's going to put me out of business. And so they came up with a cathode ray tube that created images. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I want a printing press. And so they actually came up with the first inkjet system. So the, the concept of using the cathode ray tube from Dr. Hell to A.B. Dick and then to IBM. IBM took a lot of the Digiset ideas and they created a, a subsidiary called Alphanumeric and created some of the first of the cathode ray machine, cathode ray tube machines. A spinoff from that was a company called Autologic and Autologic uh, made the machines that were sold. Alphanumeric really didn't sell anything. Um, so the cathode ray tube now enters the industry. Mergenthaler makes a deal with uh, CBS to create one using a cathode ray tube created uh, by one of the uh, engineers at CBS. Um, I remember having to drive up to Stanford, Connecticut to do pictures of it because they were doing a presentation to the Washington Post. Um, they, they sold three of the big machines um, and then they made a deal with a company in Europe, in England uh, for a, a different version, a, a different kind of cathode ray tube machine. So everybody started to get into CRT machines. Um, and so video comp was formed. Um, Veritiper gets into it. CompuGraphic gets into it a little bit later, but ultimately we start to see this movement away from, from photo mechanical machines to essentially cathode ray tube machines. By the way, if you want to see an interesting video, um, the, uh, it's called Farewell Ito and Shirdlu. It's about the night when the last page in metal was set by the New York Times because they bought two um, MGD Metro set photo typesetters, which replaced 30 linotype machines. Uh, this is why the union was so opposed to photo typesetting and why there was that big strike in New York City. Um, and the, the result of that strike was that every union member had a job for life. And it was only last year that the last person under that deal finally retired. So I started a magazine called Type World uh, to record all of this stuff. I started in 78. Uh, you can see the logo I had there was, was Times Roman Bold. I got a call from Tom Carnace who said, your, your, your logo sucks. I said, I can't afford you. So he did my logo for nothing. And that's the top one on the page on the right. So it was more than photo typesetting machines. Although there were, there were 40 suppliers of photo typesetting machines, you also had 15 suppliers of special keyboards and 25 suppliers of editing systems, and 21 suppliers of front-end systems, not counting all the people who made processes and photo materials and chemicals, and all the gadgets and gizmos that went with all this stuff, and training materials, and trainers, and by the way, 15 consultants. So I became one of the first consultants because I had worked for all these companies. Many people who wanted to get into photo typesetting had a problem. How do I choose from all of this stuff? It's mind boggling. Everything. I have to make a decision what machine, what keyboard and all that. I don't have the time to do that. So they would hire us to come in and do that for them. And I've made a lot of friends in the industry as a result. They also programmed computers to do a lot of the work. The main project of, of the computers was hyphenation and justification. 
so that the operator didn't have to make that decision, the machine would add up the width values, look at the end of the line, look at the word, see where it could break intelligently, or put a hyphen in and go on to the next line. Uh, deck computers were used most often, Data General as well, and then Prime as well. And not only did those companies sell the computers, but companies bought them as OEMs and then sold you a complete package with the software. So there are another list of companies like CSI and ATEX and others who sold you the whole system. So Linotype got into the Linotrons. Um, the one from England began as the 505. The, well, the big one that they sold to the government printing office was the 1010. Then the 505 came from England. Then they did the 303, the 202, the 404, the 606. Eventually they ran out of numbers like that and they stopped. But the one on the left there is the, um, is the 202, which was the most popular of all. It did extremely well. And then by now, Linotype had gotten very good at converting their library from one format to another. And that was because of Mike Parker. Mike Parker, who was the director of typographic development, was one of the few people who had made the transition from hot metal to photo typesetting to digital. Again, AutoLogic made their machines. They started as alphanumeric. Photon sold a version called the 7000, and then you had all their versions. One of the most popular was the Linotronic. This was a laser machine. This was the beginning of another whole generation of machines. Um, the problem was there was no way to drive it properly. Um, and so it, it, the thing that made it work was PostScript. It was the first machine to have a PostScript rip on it, raster image processor. And so you would send it a PostScript file. Later on, it would be a PDF, but it was a PostScript file at the beginning. Um, and it would set all your type digitally. It was amazing what it did. However, it was slow as molasses. I used to run seminars and have a group of people on the panel and tell me the longest time it took for a, a, a job to rip. And one guy said, well, we got the job started when we left that night and we came in in the morning and it was just finishing. Um, so later on, the rips got faster and faster. The machines got better and better, but it began with the 300. So you could, again, I was at the press conference in 85 when desktop publishing was introduced. And that was a Macintosh with a program called PageMaker. Um, with fonts that were PostScript based, you could then uh, output to a laser printer a 300 DPI for proofing or send your file to the RIP and output it at high resolution, which was um, uh, either uh, 12, 1240 or 2490 uh, DPI. Linotype had a machine called the Omnitech, which used zinc oxide coated paper like a copying machine. Um, they got mad at me because I called it the Omni Turkey. I called it the Omni Etzel, and they sued me for $35 million. I won though. Um, IBM had a very strange machine called the 6250. It was black paper coated with a thin coating of aluminum. And these little pins would erode the aluminum away to let the dots show through. It was called electro erosion. And they hired me to, say, to tell them what the font library should be. And so I did it and I thought it was interesting. I, I said to them, how'd you like that list? They said, oh, well, we had someone double check it. I said, who was that? They said, Adrian Frutiger. I said, what did he say? He said it was the best list he had ever seen for a font library. I said, wow. Well, they did half of it, but then the machine never sold and that was the end of it. So when desktop publishing came in and, and no one quite understood what this was all about because again, it seemed to be sort of low resolution there wasn't anything great there. Uh, this is Carl Dantas, who was the president of uh, CompuGraphic, and he bought a thousand, thousand leases from Apple so that you could make up a page and then output it to one of his photo typesetting machines. Well, it never quite worked the way they thought. It turned out that everybody in the company wound up with a Lisa to, to type on because they couldn't sell any. So the thing that really created the font libraries of today is PostScript. Let's be honest about it. This is where the change really took place. It was a piece of desktop publishing in 1985. When Steve Jobs went to Adobe, when they were first starting to develop, they were developing a, a, actually a front end system for creating pages and PostScript was the output module. And, and, and Jobs said, no, no, I only want the output module. And he put $14 million into Adobe to get that right. And that was the most important decision of all because now you had 
they were competitors, but it became the standard way of developing, of handling fonts, storing fonts and transmitting fonts. Um, and it was just a piece of something at the beginning. Um, so it became a font format and a print format. And so I've got the original manual there on the right. Uh, what you see in the middle is the RIP, raster image processor that you connected to your uh, laser typesetter. And then, as you recall, the, the very famous um, Seabold event where Bill Gates announced that he was uh, developing a competitor to PostScript. Um, and I remember he was up at the podium and he said, we don't have a name for it. And I yelled out, call it off. And uh, no one thought that, was, he didn't think that was funny. In any case, to get, to get even, um, Adobe essentially revealed the secrets of the type one font format, which again made PostScript even more prevalent. Of course, later on, Microsoft and Adobe did compete. They've now combined all that into one font format, if you will. Um, so pretty soon every supplier had PostScript fonts. They were all introducing fonts in PostScript form. Now, we begin now what I call the font wars. Now remember, the main library of the 20th century was the Linotype library. There, we have all the drawings for every font they did. Now there are 1300 uh, sets, but in their definition, some point, point sizes were also part of the definition. So there are probably only a few hundred fonts, real fonts, not counting the point sizes when you get right down to it. And, and that, that's the font library that most people were familiar with in the industry. So when people started to steal the fonts, borrow the fonts, um, they, they couldn't use the names because the names were copyrighted. So they would call them something else. So here you have Palatino is called Elegant, uh, Univer is called Galaxy, Caledonia is called Laurel. Uh, uh, you, you can, oh, uh, Helvetica is called Vega. By the way, when <laughs> CompuGraphic came out with their first Helvetica file, it was called Helios, and it was terrible. And so they did another version called Hel Helios 2, and I said it was twice as bad. Uh, so finally, they got it right. They called it Triumvirate, like, hey, we got it now. So. What wound up is I published for years uh, a typeface analog. I did five or six of them. And what it was was a list of all of the fonts by each company and what, or, or the name of the font and what the companies called it. Here's a closer view of it. And by the way, this, this will give you an idea how many companies were involved in the industry. A phenomenal number of organizations were involved in, in the font libraries. And again, everybody called the fonts by different names. You then had digital foundries. Now, ITC, International Typeface Corporation, was Ed Ronthala um, at Photo Lettering, Aaron Burns, who had been at TGC, who I worked with at Visual Graphics, um, and um, there was a third one. Oh, Aaron, no, that was Aaron Burns. There was a third person, and it's not coming to me easily, but it will. Um, and they produced the artwork for vendors who then would pay them royalties back. Now, what they did was, it was kind of funny, uh, like they took Garamond, which had a low X height, and they created a version with a higher X height. Um, and so they were getting, you know, payments on fonts that already existed, but they did better versions of them. Uh, one of the fonts they did was Souvenir, which got a lot of attention. Um, then there was World Typeface Corporation. Uh, the, the first font they did was Our Bodoni, um, and uh, they, that didn't last too long. Then there was Bitstream, which Mike Parker, Matthew Carter and Sherry Cohn formed, uh, which was a digital foundry and uh, supplied digital fonts. Uh, and then many, many others. I, I, I didn't want to list any others because I didn't want to miss somebody. But there, I, I would have to say it's well over 100 uh, foundries out there right now that produce digital fonts. So the fourth generation uh, became our um, laser machines. So you had the monotype laser comp. That was the first one, by the way. Then the Linotype Linotronic, ECR produced a little machine called the Pellbox, which other companies could link into in some way. A company called Tegra, which started out with plain paper. And then very other, and they all use different kinds of lasers. So you had to buy photo material that was attuned to the laser that you were using. Now, the interesting thing is that these laser machines led to computer to plate, 
which really was the single technology that wiped out the typesetting machine altogether. Because now instead of going to photo material, which you had to paste up or assemble or output as film or paper, you now could go directly to the plate and bypass all of that prepress. And that was a major change in the industry. Today, every printer, every printer in the world outputs the computer to plate or digital printing. In 1993, we start to see digital printing with, with toner. And then within a few years, we see it with inkjet. And today, I would dare say a very large percentage of what used to be offset printing is done with, with inkjet. So if you track, and I've tracked this by counting the actual number of units, and you can see the growth of photo typesetting, uh, you can see its peak, and then you start to see the, the growth of laser imaging. And so you see the decline, because they were still selling machines as laser machines were coming on the market, because people didn't quite believe that, that the lasers would do the job. Um, that, then you start to see the growth of digital printing. Then you see CTP, there was DI, direct imaging where you make the plate on the press. So the big growth area today is really digital printing. Um, that, that, that's replacing offset in many, many cases. If you want long runs, you use offset. Um, if you want anything else, books on demand, promotional material, the color is beautiful. The quality is excellent. Resolutions are up there. So digital printing today is doing everything that you would want to have done. And of course, now you have a million fonts. When I did this in 2010, um, when Matthew Carter was getting a MacArthur grant, we did a, 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 a presentation to honor him. At that time, we were about 200,000 fonts. We are now, as of my calculation uh, two months ago, we are over a million fonts. Not, no, not counting point sizes, a million fonts. So Helvetica is a font, Helvetica Italic is a font, et cetera, et cetera a million fonts. How you deal with that, I have no idea. I save all of the mailings that I get, the emailings every day from font foundries. Uh, with, and, and they don't just introduce one font family, they introduce like 10 at a time. And, and then each one of them has different weights in it. How anyone will deal with that in the future, I have no idea. Um, I was looking on Netflix the other day and they had, you know, it, when you go to the movie section, it has the uh, essentially the cover of the, what the movie uh, placard would look like. And I realized why you need so many fonts, because every movie had a different font that defines the, what that movie was or uh, how the art director saw it. Um, so you still need a lot of fonts. Whether we need a million or not, I'm not absolutely certain, but they're still coming out at a very high rate. And, uh, and I don't think it's going to abate for a long, long time because it's so easy to make digital fonts today. Um, everybody in his uncle is doing it. Uh, so that doesn't mean they should stop, but it's interesting that I can still identify the basic typefaces. I do a lot of consulting on, on forgery and counterfeiting, and I can still deal with uh, different typefaces, how they were done, when they were done. Because again, like Mike Parker, I made that transition from hot metal to photo typesetting to digital. However, if you're gonna do what I do in the future, I don't know how you're going to do that. I mean, I can go to a type specimen book from a company and see everything they did. Where will you ever find one type specimen book of a million fonts? Ain't gonna happen. So it's gonna be online and that's how you're gonna to have to find everything. So in any case, that's my little talk on the history of photo typesetting and how it really changed the photo, the, 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 the font world forever. Thank you all very much. And I would be happy to answer any questions. That was amazing, Frank. Um, I love that you end on the slide with uh, the tally. Uh, and, and I completely agree. I think like we're obviously going to keep growing in, in the number of fonts and we're actively producing more and more typeface designers in this program. So it's, uh, it's, it's a growing, growing field. Uh, I think that's good. Yeah, I think so too. I think that there's always, um, there's such a, it's such an intricate art. Uh, there's so many variables, uh, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended to, to, uh, to, to making type that I think that we can keep making and making lots of stuff. Um, just a note for everybody, don't forget to send questions in the Q&A. There's, there's, a, there's a number of questions already in there. So if you have questions for Frank, uh, send, them, send them in. But uh, thank you, Frank, for, for such a great, uh, 
foray into into photo uh lots of lots of great uh fantastic names the machines i think that's the era where um the machines themselves had had such a uh an amazing array of 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 names i don't think there's another technology that that came close to uh, such uh, fun names um let me take a few questions in there um the first question came in um at the beginning of the talk was uh, from martin flores and he asked, uh, why did the U.S. government buy the inner type photo setter? Was that something around the Second World War? Was it something that was like kind of pushed by the war effort? No, they bought it in 40, starting in 49, and they okay. bought them over a period of 10 years. And the concept was that they were going to bypass paste up by going directly to film. And that, that's the reason they did it. They didn't realize how complex a machine it was and the problems they would have with it because they wound up having to make corrections by stripping in other pieces of film. And that was a real problem with positive film. So it was a terrible mistake. By the way, lots of controversies with the government because the government printing office, um, uh, there was a, in, in 1911 or so, uh, they bought a ton of monotypes and the president of Linotype went to Teddy Roosevelt, went into the White House, made an appointment and said, you're making a terrible mistake. So Teddy Roosevelt started a commission to investigate and they saw nothing wrong. And so Teddy Roosevelt called the president of Mergenthaler back into the office and berated him for wasting the time of the executive. So the government has always had interesting choices in times of machines. When they bought the Linotron 1010, the one that was made with CBS, um, they only made five of them and four of them wound up at the government printing office. And years later, I did a consulting for the government printing office and we replaced all of them with four laser printers. Wow. <laughs> Um, let me see. Let me take another question that maybe is sort of related. Um, actually, this is a really good question from, from Stephen Coles. Um, why do you think the phototype error is often skipped or mostly skipped in design history books and programs? Is it just because it's too complicated to explain? Is it because instructors don't find it as important as metal and digital? Do you have a, do you have a thought? It was just too short a period of time and you can't use those machines for anything today. Mm -hmm. And so the reason it was skipped over is no one sees them. Mm -hmm. They're not out there at all. And by the way, is, as you saw from this presentation, just trying to talk about the technology, because there were so many different technologies in use, yeah. becomes very complicated. And a lot of writers don't want to go through all of that. So that's why you don't see anything about this. And by the way, it only in just under 50 years and literally gone. The mm -hmm. only collection of machines is at the Museum of Printing. No one else saved them. Right. And we talked a little bit about this before the talk, like the... You know, like the proofing presses are now um, used for letterpress. You can do like um, boutique, small scale letterpress printing. It's very easy to keep those machines. Even even the linotype machines could be kept in, in use. It, it's not, you know, it's complicated, but it could be doable. But with with photo, there's there's the technological components like the film, the chemistry, right? Like there are just things that are not available. You can't find the supplies, right? Like the very basics that they need to run. That's right. Letterpress, we can still make mechanical machines work. You can still make polymer plates if you want. So you can still print with letterpress today. So yeah. letterpress is still around, but phototype setting isn't. Yeah. And by the way, in the future, you know, offset, you know, the, the offset vendors get mad at me. Um, you know, the big machines are still out there, but newspapers, you know, are going digital in many cases. Um, a lot of stuff is going inkjet. Um, I don't know where offset presses, we, we keep getting offered offset presses for the museum and no museum is going to display offset presses. There was nothing historic about them. Right, right. Um, Paul Shaw just asked a question in the chat. Uh, what role- Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, what role did type houses have in the second revolution? Um, not much. Um, in fact, the type houses, in fact, I'm about to start writing a book on the history of typesetting services. In fact, here are some of the specimen books from typesetting services. <laughs> um, and uh, again, their problem was they could never keep up with all the fonts that were coming up in the digital era. They had all started with, with first with handset type, but then with linotype. That was the key to everything. Um, you had about 4,000 typesetting services in, in America alone. And it was a multi-billion dollar business because they set type for advertising agencies, book publishers, et cetera. Um, then when word processing came along, they lost all the input income because now the, font, the, the data was coming in electronically. They didn't need to re-keyboard everything. Mm -hmm. And then when desktop publishing came along, the graphic designer could go directly to a proof 
uh, and then directly to an output device uh, with PostScript. And so why did you need a typesetting service? Although I have to admit the typesetting services did proofreading. Uh, they, they made sure you were doing the right job. Uh, they questioned things. They made you better at what you did as a designer. But again, desktop publishing essentially wiped out the, uh, the typesetting service. Right, right. Yeah, we have, I don't know, like you could see it kind of above, above my desk here. Um, we have some, some catalogs and, and I mean, we, we, keep, we keep getting more and more catalogs from that era. It's uh, everyone had, uh, had a, a very rich supply, uh, especially during the, the photo times. It's, uh, well, it was interesting in New York City, TANI, the Typographers Association of New York, um, what they did was they issued the directory of all the fonts that every member had. And if you didn't, if you were a member, didn't have that font, one of the other members would lend it to you. Mm -hmm. And so you had a lot of messages moving Linotype magazines around uh, New York City at any moment in time. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, it's actually like thinking of that and something that you mentioned earlier, I was curious, like if you could talk maybe a little bit about like the, the labor and, and the role of unions in, in the printing industry and especially in photo, like did that, did that change uh, with photo? And you mentioned, you brought up the, the role of women um, changed in, in uh, because of the, the photo technology, but maybe you talk about like a little bit on, on about the unions, the role of unions. You know, the first union, one of the first unions formed in America was the International Typographical Union. Um, um, it, it formed in a, the, at the New York Tribune, uh, where, where the publisher actually invited them to unionize. Uh, Horace Greeley, uh, by the way, there are two statues of Horace Greeley in New York City. Uh, one is Greeley Square, right next to, uh, um, uh, um, in front of Macy's. Um, yeah, Herald Square. Next to Herald yeah. Square. Um, and uh, I, publishers have hated Greeley ever since uh, because the unions were, had phenomenal power because you didn't get a second chance to get that newspaper out. And it took an army of people to set type by hand. And then when the linotype came in, first they, they, they were against it, but then the, the unions, the union um, essentially monopolized it. Because the linotype was the same machine, whether you bought it from Intertype or, or, or linotype, um, they trained you on it. And so if you wanted an operator, it was a skilled ITU person who did that. And so, the International Typographical Union had phenomenal power. Now, when photo typesetting came in, the union had a problem because every photo typesetting machine was different. They couldn't train everybody on one machine and those skills could be used on other machines. <coughs> so they could never supply skilled operators to the newspapers, typesetting services or whomever. And so they, they negotiated contracts like the one with the New York Times and others and little by little, it dwindled. I remember Bert Powers, who was the head of the ITU in New York City, the big six, used to come to my seminars, seeing if there was any way the union could monopolize again their right. particular area. Um, it didn't happen at all. And so the power of the unions went away. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in some ways, I'm sure the, the shift to photos, as you pointed out, like the, and the eventually digital uh, typesetting in, in some ways eliminates the typesetter completely and eliminates the the collective labor um, or, or uni unionized protected labor uh, from from that you know because it's it's now in the hands of the end user in some ways the designer and kind of you know, points to the lack of of labor union uh, within design within the graphic design applications it's interesting to consider so now the graphic designer is totally responsible for their job. Uh, I, I used to do a seminar at RIT for the design school called how to design something you can't print. <laughs> you know, it'd be, you know, like, you know, if there's something on the screen you don't want, just cover it with a white box. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and it's perfectly okay to mix RGB and CMYK colors. Don't worry about it. Uh, there was that kind of a seminar um, because again, graphic designers try to take shortcuts and many of them create problems. 82% of the files that go to printers today for printing have a problem with them. <laughs> um, well, that's why the books like Pocket Pal are important uh, you know, to, to sort of get that, that sort of training in there. Um, let me go back through a couple of questions. There's was, there was a question from Kevin Woodland who um, uh, noted the, uh, the chart. The, the, it w I think it was the second to last slide. Uh, where did that phototype setting 1949 to 1999 diagram come from? He says it's a pretty interesting data. Was that something that you put together? Yeah, I put together. 
again, I have had access uh, to how many machines were shipped by every company of every model. And I had saved all that data because I wrote a book called The History of, History of Photo Typesetting, um, which I did as a project with uh, 13 students at Cal Poly uh, when I taught there for 10 weeks. Uh, we're, by the way, the second edition is at the uh, printer right now because I've, I've fixed it and also expanded it. Um, and so that chart was one that I did for that book and had actual data in order to create those, those charts. And it really interesting to see how it all worked out. Mm -hmm. So another question that, that came up in, in, in your talk about the Frutiger, um, JTA says, do you still have that list of fonts Frutiger complemented or do you know of <laughs> yet? It's probably- I don't, I don't think so. No. no, I don't think so. I don't think I saved that for some strange reason. There's some really great um, articles that the uh, Journal of Typographic Research, which, which eventually became Visible Language, um, has, has recently published all of their articles in PDF form. And, and there's a couple of articles that Fritika wrote about uh, photo type settings. So if folks are interested, um, seek out those, those, uh, those, those couple articles, uh, free, free PDFs in, in, um, online. I can um, tell you about the first time I met Herman Zoff. Yeah. Um, I was delivering the mail to his cubicle. They brought him into Brooklyn, gave him a cubicle on the eighth floor and said, H. Zoff. And so I walked in one day and I said, Mr. Zoff, what do you do? <laughs> he said, I correct the errors of my youth. He was modifying Palatino for photo typesetting. And uh, who knew that 33 years later, I would have his endowed chair at RIT. And he became a good friend. He was a, a wonderful gentleman and a great artist. There was, he was part of, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, uh, DPI, I think was the acronym for it. I think he was working with um, uh, Lou Ballin and Ron Thaler and Aaron to, to start like a, a digital typesetting, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were going to create templates. So if you were going to do a brochure, you could pick a certain kind of template that had been designed by Herman Zoff with his typefaces and layout and everything. Uh, that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's been tried recently. I think in in, in publishing, it's uh, it's it's still an idea that people pursue. Well, it's, it's it's sort of akin to clip art, you know, clip design, clip art, same thing. Right, layouts. Um, Nick, I think you an answered this and you talk a little bit, um, but Nick Sherman asked. Um, I know of many places that have working hot metal equipment, but do you know of anywhere that uh, have operational photo type sitting equipment? Maybe at the Museum of Printing. I think you you you. Um, I have an iTech Quadratech here, which I think I can get working, but I don't have the chemistry, the processor, or the, uh, or the material. Right. So I can, I can make the machine do things on the screen, but I can't do anything as an output. Mm -hmm. So that's the limitation right now. Right. right. I do have a Lisa that I've almost got working, but that's something different. <laughs> um, let me see if there's... Um... Uh, so this is from uh, Betsy Chesson. Um, is there um, some rule regulation that requires a new font have X number of differences from previous fonts? I guess that's more of like a privacy, uh, a piracy protection, right? There is no law. There is no general practice. When uh, Microsoft did Arial, they changed five letters. Everything else is the same as Helvetica. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't even think they needed to do those five, by the way, because there is no um, regulation that controls that at all. Mm -hmm. And you know, like um, you mentioned earlier in your talk, ITC, I, I, the first issue of UNLC, the the publication produced by ITC, the the cover story there was the push for legislation to be created to protect fonts. I, you know, it very much squares with the phototype um, era and, and the pretty rampant piracy of, of you know, or, or ease of piracy of photo, you know, due to photo of, of typefaces. And um, I think there was a, they, they, you know, they had like a script, call your senator, um, advocate oh, yes. for. Oh yes, and so Cynthia Hollinsworth and I ran a lot of articles in my magazine in Type World and we pushed very hard at it. Uh, but uh, Congress was not interested, um, and uh, it, it's a shame it never went through. I, again, I can understand the problem. How do you how do you separate design elements from letters? 
they don't stand on their own. I think that was Congress's problem at the, the codification of the first Copyright Act. Um, and it had to do with design, not only of letters, but of furniture, lamps, all kinds. Of, how do you take the design elements away and they stand on their own as design elements from the utilitarian device or thing that it is? And so I understand the problem. Um, and again, and again um, it was rampant. Not, every company got into photo types and he had no library. They all had to steal the library from somebody. And mm. it was linotype in most cases. Right. Yeah, because the only protection you can get is like a patent, right? You can get like a, a trademark for the for the name and and you can uh, get a copyright for the name. Or you can get a patent if the typeface is part of another element. Like if it's part of a name plate that's cast in bronze, then you can get a, a protection for that whole device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting subject to think about, like especially like since I think like the argument by the by the Congress or the US government was always like letters belong to everyone, you know, it's, it's letters are letters and, and like, how do you separate the design of that letter versus the letter itself? If, it, if an A is an A, you know, how do you protect it? Um, if anybody wants to do research, I have the only copy of the copyright hearings that were done when Linotype sued uh, the Copyright Office. <laughs> well. So you can That's, hear all the lawyers and all their their arguments. Nice, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And and Maurice um, uh, posted in chat like um, uh, a link to Cade Bordeaux's uh, new book about a discussion of the legal uh, design semiotic issues issues around that. So thanks, Maurice. Um, there was a really interesting question here um, from Jeff Jarvis. Uh, uh, Jeff says, Frank, thank you uh, for such a wonderful information packed talk. What, in your view, was the death knell to Mergenthaler linotype? <laughs> because it kept getting, the company kept getting sold and resold. When I was there, it was Mergenthaler linotype company. And we had to tell people that it was an American company and spell Mergenthaler for them. Um, and then um, a new group came in that controlled the stock. And they then merged it with Electro Autolite and called it Ultra Corporation. And they became a conglomerate. They bought up all kinds of, I did the annual meeting one year and I dealt with how many grits, how many grits and bricks and everything you could imagine. Um, um, so, okay, so that went on for a while. And then they sold the whole thing to Allied Chemical. Um, and, and again, the people at the top, the, the stockholders, they made most of the money out of all of this. Um, Allied Chemical didn't know what to do with Mergenthaler, so they took that part of it and put it under Bunker Ramo. Bunker Ramo didn't know what to do with it. It was an alien industry to them. Um, and so they wound up selling it to um, the Commerce Bank in Germany. So it now becomes a German company, and they dropped the Mergenthaler name. So it's just now Linotype Company. And that, that goes on for a while. And then the Commerce Bank buys hell, and they merge them, and they call it, you ready for this? Linotype hyphen hell, <laughs> worst branding you could possibly have. <laughs> and that goes on for a while. Um, and, 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 and then they spin off the type library as something separate. Um, and Heidelberg then buys what's left. Now, there are lawsuits going on to this day involving linotype machines. <clears throat> in the crucible, the pot that had the molten metal in it, um, there were two uh, inner wall and an outer wall, and in between was asbestos. And as you know, there's a gigantic mesothelioma fund out there, and every lawyer salivates when they hear anybody mention asbestos. And so I was recently, in, in, believe it or not, uh, an expert witness on a case involving a guy that worked at the Los Angeles Times in the 1960s and 70s, um, who said he was exposed to asbestos, and he sued, they sued Heidelberg. Uh, so as you can see, the company, as it, as it kept changing hands, it didn't quite get the right blend of people to know what to do with it. And so they made machines that were overpriced. They had management that was inept in most cases. Um, and so somebody should, if you read my book, The History of the Linotype Company, um, it tells you a lot of those stories. Super interesting. Yeah, and Nick, Nick Sherman said, like, uh, I'd love to see a corporate family tree of all this stuff. Uh, same here. I think it would be uh, <laughs> really fascinating to see. 
Um, there was a question I, I, uh, uh, from Kathy O'Gara. Um, how did Strike On Type, IBM Composer, et cetera, fit into the mix? By the way, that's where the term cold type really came from. Mm -hmm. um, so you had three devices. It started with the Veritype or typewriter, which had this little metal circular unit, um, which had proportional space. Uh, then the Justo writer, which had the input unit that produced paper tape. And then you ran it on a typewriter that had proportional space. And then the IBM Composer, the standalone version, and the tape-operated version. Those were the three machines for strike-on typography. Because again, there was hot metal, they called it cold type. Um, and so we formed a group called the Cold Type Composition Association, which became the National Composition Association. And even into the 1970s and even 80s, there were people who were still doing forms and small jobs using typewriter composition. And it was a viable industry. Um, there was another question I just saw. Um, this, this kind of maybe opens up a, a bigger conversation, but there's a question from uh, um, George LeBon. Uh, any comments on Ed Benguet and ITC? I mean, Ed, working for ITC, of course, Ed worked for photo lettering um, as well. I mean, that, that's they okay. were all, it was all interrelated. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and something that, um, Nick, Nick Sherman also kind of uh, brought up like the this idea of how machines, some of these photo machines allowed uh, for publications to produce their own custom photo fonts in house. Like, um, I'm trying to like, um, Nick, I, I'm, I'm presuming you mean like um, uh, having like the ability to, to make custom type, right? Like, so publications could make their own custom typefaces using um, photo type technology. You can easily not commission really. someone. Not for photo type setting technology. It's only when uh, digital came along, mm -hmm. Fontographer and other programs allowed you to make your own fonts. Mm -hmm. Before that, you had very proprietary systems that made fonts. That was the issue. But like for, for, let's say, like a publication could commission like a, a photo version of something like a piece of lettering that could turn, I mean, like mostly for headlining, right? I mean, we, we, it would be very difficult to do a text face, but you could do a headliner, like you could do a custom, like how, how maybe how, how common was it for someone to get a, a custom design that wasn't commercially available? There could you hand, do that? There were hand letterers out there who would do anything you wanted. Mm -hmm. And in New York City, it was a phenomenal number. Mm -hmm. So they would hand letter certain lettering, have stats made, and then use it for reproduction. Mm -hmm. Would or could you get it like as a photo headliner, like a VGC or? or um... Um, there were companies that allowed you to make headline fonts, like the VGC font, because it was just a two-inch film strip with the letters one after another. Mm -hmm. so there was nothing special about it at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. There was another. Interesting question. I just skipped over. Um, well, Dan Evans asked, and there's, there's another um, question sort of related to it um, um, from uh, Katie Garth. So combine the two questions. Dan asked, do you know of anyone creatively repurposing the fondest machinery parts artistically or otherwise? And Kath, uh, Katie's uh, question was, do you know of amateur practitioners who used any of these photo processes for uh, self-publishing or graphic arts experimentation? Or did the business-driven nature of the machines keep the practice in, almost entirely within commerce? There were a few people who bought their own photo typesetting machines. When the copywriter came out because it was so inexpensive, people put them in their bedrooms and produced their own publications. Mm -hmm. um, but there were very few of them that I, I, I know about. Mm -hmm. I imagine the cost was, was a bit prohibitive, right, for some, some of them. you had, don't forget, you also needed the processor. You needed to be able to do paste up. Again, you didn't get full pagination devices until we entered the digital era. Before that, all photo typesetting machines, they could produce galleys, um, they could produce multiple columns. Um, it was only when computers then allowed them to mix headlines and text. But even then the photo typesetting machines uh, didn't do a good job on large point sizes. You had to have separate fonts for doing that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't run in the same machine all the time. So photo typesetting machines did not, did not allow full pagination that only came when you get into the digital era. Mm -hmm. um, there's something I was gonna ask about that, but I, I think I just lost. Um... I have the same problem, but I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm getting, I'm getting there. Um, let's see. There was, um, uh, there's a question. Um, well, I think the, um, um, yeah, lost it. It's gone. <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I remember I like the, probably the thing that maybe allowed, um, uh, a more efficient way of and a more budgets uh, uh, friendly way was uh, Letra set. I think that was probably a more instrumental in allowing like a self publishing or kind of a smaller scale self publishing, right? A lot of the grunge magazines of the 1950s and 60s existed because of Letra set. Rub down lettering was fantastic and they had wonderful fonts. It was a lot of work to do what you had to do with it. Um, and then they used typewriters for the text and they used letter set for the headlines. Um, letter set tried to get into the, uh, the desktop publishing market. They had programs for doing what Photoshop did, what InDesign did, um, but they didn't succeed at all. In fact, mm -hmm. I still have the programs here. And didn't, didn't letter set, um, uh, try to buy ITC, um, or was it the other way around? ITC tried to buy a, a, a SLT a Letra set, and then they bought. Like I forget, there was there's something, and maybe Dan Radigan, who's I think watching, could could. Uh, I think that there was like someone tried to buy the other, and then eventually it went the other way. The other person, <laughs> the other company, bought the other out. I don't recall that story, but I'm sure it's true. Everybody was trying to buy somebody else in those days. Right. Right. <laughs> flush with 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 money um well itc made a lot of money not only from licensing funds but also selling advertising in unlc right it was a phenomenal business um right and i think like the uniqueness of um um itc in some ways is that uh they managed the design but then were able to produce uh the you know kind of uh put the designs into various systems, right? You talked about like the, the incom incompatibility of the various typesetting machines, like ITC was able to license and work with the various manufacturers, right? You, you could get, let's say avant-garde and you can get it on here okay. and you can get it here. So what they did was they supplied artwork. I think it was eight inches high, um, something like that. And so every, so every supplier needed artwork. And so they would supply the artwork and then the manufacturer like CompuGraphic would then adapt it to whatever their system was. Mm -hmm. And so they and, didn't have to cut ruby lists and all that. It was all done. All they had to do was organize it in terms of width values um, and, and photograph it onto film or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, that, and every company had different fonts. So therefore, ITC couldn't come up with different versions for everyone. They came up with one version and everyone adapted it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you, you essentially got the license from them and you know, they were able to leverage like the the kind of the best-selling hits and, and many of them drawn by Tom initially, Tom Carnes, um, in, in, in the early days of ITC. Um, um, the only problem I had with ITC was a lot of the funds they did were all, they did, redid Caslon, they, they, they redid Garamond. Yeah. You know, we really need to do that? Um, so they, 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 that's what people complained about. What they wanted to see were new and unique typefaces. Right. Well, I, avant-garde probably was sort of the more the more unique. Um, oh, that uh, got more attention. That that first came out on the typepositor. Don't forget, mm -hmm. and that did phenomenally well. Of course, everyone misuses it, unless you have the same words that Herb Ballin had when he did it. Doesn't look right. Right, right. Uh, and Dan, thank you for for uh, putting this in the chat. Dan writing again. Uh, ITC and Letra said ended up being bought by the same company, and they effectively merged. And then he says ITC Monotype and Letra said were all eventually merged onto Agfa. It was all, <laughs> which is what we're seeing now. Yeah, well, um, Agfa had a type division, and um, the guy who ran it spun it off as a separate company, and that today is Monotype Imaging, where Dan worked for a long time. Right, right. Yeah, and everything is now. Uh, or most everything is turned into monotype. Well, I um, understand there are more lawyers on staff than there are type designers. Right. Um, there was a question, I think, um, Chuck Byrne, uh, we have we have a couple of minutes. I'm going to uh, just maybe take a couple of last, last questions. So if anyone has any, any questions that uh, they haven't sent, then just send it in. I'll, I'll make sure to send it to Q&A. Uh, Chuck Byrne asked, didn't some newspapers end up with union contracts requiring keyboarding being duplicated on both linotype machines and phototype with only the phototype being used in the paste up of the paper? Yes, it started as something called bogus. Because <laughs> At that time, newspapers set all the ads. 
And so if you sent in an ad that was already typeset, there was a department that would reset it. Um, they would use the one you sent in, but they would reset it so that the union operators did not lose work. And so that went through in, in the photo typesetting era, the unions wanted to do the same thing. And the newspapers fought that tooth and nail. So very few newspapers did that aspect of it, but the bogus lasted a long time. I love it. Um, let's see, there was a good question from Jeff Jarvis. Uh, Frank, uh, this is uh, uh, this from the guy who gave the museum an Osborne and Morrow pivot. What machines do you wish you could acquire? <laughs> I need an Alto. I need a Xerox Alto. I have almost everything else. And by the way, that Osborne is on display and people love that little teeny screen. So if, if, if people are watching or will be watching this later, uh, if you know <laughs> where, where to get uh, the Alto for, for, uh, for Frank, let him know, <laughs> give, give it to the museum. That's right. um, this, is, this is what you know, uh, the outreach can do. And let me see if there's one last question that we can take before we wrap up. Um, there was a um, kind of a specific question um, from Pina Trogo. Uh, I don't have the latest 21st edition of Pocket Pal, but in the 2007 20th edition, there's a half tone screen enlargement, CMYK Rosetta pattern of a detail from a photo of a chair. The photo, however, uh, and I think the rest of the book is actually printed with a stochastic or other digital raster. Just curious if you could talk about the, that page or the printing of Pocket Pal in general. I don't have a, I don't know from memory. Yeah. Um, I'd have to go back. Yeah, Pino, maybe you can reach out to, to Frank um, and, and ask that question. Um, what, oh, what year was it again that he said? Uh, the last edition, I think. Uh, well, the, the 20th edition. Uh, Pino's mentioning the 2007 20th edition. Uh, and let me see. There was. Uh, Cat Hughes, this is a good last question. Are there copies of your type world publications, Frank, available as digital files online? No, I have all the original copies here, but they've not been digitized. Mm -hmm. um, I spent most of the last few years um, cleaning up some of the stuff for the inland printer. So I've got most of that digitized. Uh, RIT did most of it, and I've been doing some that, that weren't done. And that's taken a lot of time. We do, again, we're all volunteers at the museum, and there are a yeah. million things I want to digitize. I was just going to say, this is maybe like a good note. If, 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 if anyone wants to volunteer and lives in the area, uh, volunteer at the museum. Oh, um, one of the things we have here is, um, the, I call it the Chapler collection because it's based on John Chapler, but it's almost every promotion piece used for promoting type in the 20th century. Yeah. So the original brochures on Futura, if you will. Uh, all the stuff from Continental Type Founders. It's just amazing, all the stuff that we have there. And I'd love to digitize all of that because it tells a wonderful story of the evolution of type. Yeah. Well, if, if, if folks feel um, they can they can help out uh, in some way because uh, with, with what Frank is doing and, and what the museum is doing is invaluable. This is like the preservation of this history and preservation of this technology, but also like being able to talk about it and, and share that knowledge. So thank, thank you so much, Frank, for this amazing, amazing um, look at that, you know, relatively short, but incredibly influential period of, of typesetting and, and for being here with us tonight. And uh, I hope you all learned something new and, and something exciting and, and, um, and enjoyed, uh, like I enjoyed uh, Frank's great sense of humor about, uh, uh, about that period. So thank you everyone for, 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 for coming. Um, the talk will be available to watch later. Thank you, Frank. Have a, have a wonderful night and stay safe everyone and uh, be